Precious Church, this is a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for me to be able to talk to you and to bring God's encouraging word to you once again. So here we are, what worshiping, loving, praising, thanking our God. Even in the t- even though we can't be at church together physically, we are together spiritually. And how do we remain patient when we're innately impatient? At least I have to say that about me. And I think most of us as God's children are innately impatient children of God. But we God is teaching us patience. Yeah, he is. And, you know, I learned and I, saw, I was so, so inspired and encouraged by my, I have two grandsons, but my one grandson, my oldest grandson, He was awaiting the arrival of his siblings, and we were so worried. How would he handle the fact that he would not be able to be with his family because of COVID? He couldn't, he was not allowed in the hospital. And so for three days and nights, his mommy, his daddy, and the babies were all in the hospital, and he was left out. Imagine. Imagine waiting all this time and then to be the only one left out. Grandpa, his, my husband Jim and I, we took care of him during these days. And I was so inspired by him. He would say, let's drive by the hospital, Grandma or Grandpa. Let's drive by the hospital. And we would. And we would roll down the window. And he would do as he always did when he said goodbye to Grandpa and I. He did the same thing now. He'd wave at the hospital windows, and he'd call out, I love you, family. I love you, Mommy. I love you, Daddy. I love you, babies. Jesus bless you. We did that at least once a day, and he never, ever once complained. And I just want to be encouraged by that, and I want to say to you, even though I'm impatient, and I want to see you all so much, I want you to be able to be able to come into the church with us and not to feel left out there like JJ was at the hospital. But I want to say to you, church family, I'm rolling down the window, and I'm putting out my hand, and I'm going, I love you, church family. I love you. Jesus bless you. We will get through this. We will be together again. And in the meantime, We will praise, we will worship, we will even make a joyful noise right there in our homes. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with singing, Hope Center. That's what we're doing. Come before the presence of the Lord with singing and praise to his name. Amen. We're happy to be in God's house today to praise his name. Thank you, Lord, for today. We praise your name for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Are you excited to be in God's house? Thank the Lord this morning for all that he's done and all that he's going to do this week. Just thank him right now. Say thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done and all that you will do. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, Hope Center. God is good. And all the time. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And just in case, if you didn't get that uh, page number, yes, I see you, 57, for Make a Joyful Noise. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, come before him singing with his giving to the praise. Shout 
today is from Isaiah 60, verse 1 and verses 18 to 20. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. No longer will violence be heard in your land, nor ruin or destruction within your borders. But you will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. Your sun will never set again and your moon will wane no more. The Lord will be your everlasting light and your days of sorrow will end. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Now we will receive your tithes and your offerings. We encourage you to participate in this part of our worship service. You can go to our website and give electronically via PayPal or sending a check. The information as to how to give your tithes and offerings can be found at Hope Center OC. Org. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we say thank you for our ability and our desire to give back a portion of what you've given us. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for all of the blessings you've given us, and we are thankful that during this time of this pandemic, that our faithful members and friends have continued to give to support not just this ministry, but to support your work in this world. And so, dear God, I thank you for blessing each friend and each member. And God, we give you all glory and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You Luke 19.35. Then they led the donkey to Jesus. They put some of their clothing, this is the disciples, on his back and helped Jesus get on it. 
And as he rode along, the people spread their clothes on the road in front of him. When Jesus was starting down the Mount of Olives, his large crowd of disciples were happy and praised God because of all the miracles they had seen. They said, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. We're going to join and sing, Blessed is the king, and we're going to split. This side will start and this side will answer, okay? With blessed is the king, all right? We're happy to be in God's house. We're happy to praise him just like the disciples and the people did that day. Hallelujah to the King of Kings.
Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, worship team. Thank you for reminding us that the king is still on the throne. And so we do, we echo that. Blessed is the king. Blessed is the king. He is the reason, he is the reason <laughs> that we have hope. He is the reason that we continue to believe and continue to be encouraged. I also want to thank my dear, dear brother in Christ, Pastor Harold, for sharing us with scripture today. Um, you know, there's only one other person, sorry, Harold, who reads scripture better than you, but there's only one, and that was my dad. And you're our close second, Harold, and thank you so much. We love it when you read scripture for us. So we're, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful gift from our worship team and from Harold. So today's message, I'm continuing in this new message series on excelling in exile. Exile. What a new concept for maybe many of you, because it's not talked about that much, and yet I think it's so relevant to what we are experiencing today, because I do believe that we are in a time of exile. Now, a brief reminder that we are always and have been since the day we are born until the day we go to heaven, we are in a perpetual state of spiritual exile, because this world, earth, is a hostile and foreign land for us Christians. Our real home is in heaven. We're just passing through. This is a perpetual state of spiritual exile for all of us Christians, and that's okay because we know this is not our final destination. We know heaven is our home. And we remember that. We remember that no matter what we are going through. So we remember that. I also want to remind you that in, with, when, in terms of the physical exile that we're going through today, I want to give you my definition of exile. It's a little lengthy, but it's important. These definitions, I hope you will allow me to read it because definitions are not that easy. This is what I believe exile is. Exile is a time when God actually removes his people from their home. They're familiar. He removes them from their familiar, from their culture, from their normal, for an extended period of time. Exile is a loss of freedom. Think of it like an extended time out for an entire nation, or in the case of this virus, to the entire world. This forced absence from church, culture, yes, church, culture, way of life, freedoms, is the real pain and hardship embedded in any time of exile, and this is what we have been experiencing, yes? But we are learning through this time of exile from, that we're going through, that is virus-induced, but we're learning how to get through it, how not to just exist in it, how not just to endure it, but how to excel in our time of exile by studying the Epic, epic, Babylonian exile. Because there's lessons there, and God can speak to us for our times today by learning about that time. We learn from the Babylonian exile is that exile always comes to an end. Exile is not extinction. extinction. There will be a day. There will be. Sooner or later, when we will exit our exile. And in the meantime, let us not succumb to the temptation to prematurely seek to escape from our exile. Because that is what we're all doing. We're all kind of chomping at the bits and trying to break free of these chains of the exile and wanting to escape this time of exile but this exile is God's plan. This exile is what God has given to us. And I'm saying given, yes, because given is a gift. How can this be a gift? Oh, that's what this whole message series is about. I don't want you to have to just endure, just exist 
through this exile, try to think, how can I escape it? And in the process, miss out on the blessings that God has embedded in this time, in this season. So last week, we were encouraged by the examples of the biblical champions of exile. And we know, you know them, they're very familiar. Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we learned how, how they, not, they didn't just exist in exile, they excelled in exile. And what they did when they, like, how do we excel in exile? Their example is to bring glory to God. God is glorified through exile. That is one of the main purposes of exile. God is glorified. You know, think about it. Think about it. When Daniel and his friends, because of the exile, they were captured in Jerusalem, dragged all the way back to Babylonian. And there in Babylonia, they brought their God with them. Did they not? And they brought, and as a result, they brought their God to King Nebuchadnezzar and King Darius. These pagan kings of Babylonia were converted. They began to, they believed in God and Daniel's God. They believed in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's God. They believed in God, that God, the God Yahweh, as the one true God. These pagan gods of this mighty, mighty kingdom were converted. That is God being glorified, not only in exile, but because of the exile. So be encouraged that God is going to do the same thing through ours. Would he not? Why would he allow it if he's not going to bring glory himself? As a, and he, it's a time for him to showcase. Exile is a time for God to showcase his power, his might, his majesty. His mercy. This is a time when he will do it. And deliverance, not just to you and me, but expect it. Look for it. Will he not only bring glory and this deliverance and showcase to pagan authorities, pagan kings, pagan empire, emperors, pagan presidents? It's possible. Look for it. Expect it. But what about church? Oh, the doors of the church have been closed. How can that possibly bring glory to God, right? Is that what you're asking yourself? It's a good question if you are. Because the, the doors of God's church have been closed. I know some have been reopened, but too many of them were closed and hands that can remain closed for such a long period of time not just here in America, not just here in California, not just here in Orange County, but in the entire world, churches' doors have been closed. How do we make sense of this? Well, that's the theme for my message. So today I'm going to teach you about the Babylonian exile. In the midst of an exile, God always... God always retains a remnant. In the midst of an exile, God always returns the remnant to their home. And in the midst of an exile, God always, I hope you don't miss this point, restores the losses. He does. He will do this for his people, for you. And there have been losses during exile. There always is. There's always a loss or two or many, many more, sometimes incalculable losses. But God promises he will restore it for his people and his church. To illustrate that point and to tell you I'm not just making this up. It's not just an empty belief of mine. It is rooted in God's word. It is rooted in scripture. And I'm picking up on the story where I left off last week. Last week we we talked about how the prophet Jeremiah, he prophesied that this king Nebuchadnezzar would come, he would capture God's children, his nation, and carry them off into captivity. The prophet Jeremiah prophesied that 40 years before it happened, 
40 years before it happened. It was written and recorded. And now we know that it did happen. And in Daniel 1, last week I read to you how King Nebuchadnezzar not only destroyed Jerusalem and captured the people and dragged them away from their homeland. Hear me here. This is an important part today. He also plundered the temple treasures. He stole God's treasures from God's temple and took it back with him to Babylonia and put it in the temples of the pagan gods. This is God's treasure. God's treasure. God's church plundered. God's treasures stolen. Removed from his home. Carried off and placed in a pagan church. A word on these treasures. Wow. These were not just little things like, like it, not just little things like plants or microphones or cameras. No, 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 no. God's treasures in the temple treasury are described in 1 Chronicles 29. And I'm going to ask you to indulge me and listen to this because you are going to be amazed like I am when I read it. 1 Chronicles 29, verse 2. This is written by King David, and these are King David's words, recorded years and years ago. With all my resources, I, David, have provided for the temple of my God, gold for the gold work, silver for the silver, bronze for the bronze, iron for the iron, wood for the wood, as well as onyx for the settings, turquoise, stones of various colors, and all kinds of fine stone and marble, all of these in large quantities. Wait till you hear how much. Verse 3, David continues, Besides, in my devotion to the temple of my God, I now give my personal treasures of gold and silver for the temple of my God. He says that again, for the temple of my God. Over and above everything I have provided for this temple, holy temple, I, David, give 3,000 talents of gold. Now, you don't know, I don't know what that means unless you go and look it up. And I'm here to tell you, each talent is about 75 pounds. So the gold that David gave to the temple in today's value would equate $50 billion. Wow. That's what he gave to the, this is what the temple treasure was. Think of it. Think of it. All temple treasures were taken by Nebuchadnezzar, and God allowed it to happen. Hmm. And then, 70 years, the people lived in exile. For 70 years, they were unable to worship in the temple. For 70 years, God's treasures held hostage in a foreign land, pagan land. And it was during this time that God's children, they had, been, they had taken God for granted. Not only that, they were unfaithful to him. Were they not prior to going into exile? When they had their temple, they took it for granted. Many of them neglected to go to temple, to go to worship. They ignored their God. They were unfaithful to God. Now that they can't, can't go, now that their church has been destroyed, now that they've been removed from it, now that they can't go, and the doors are closed, now they begin to long and yearn for the temple. Do we not see that this is what has also happened for us during our time of this virus-induced exile? So many of us, me included, have a tendency to, when it's free, when it's open, oh, we take it for granted. 
This is, we, we neglect it even. It's true. I know we, we all, if we're honest with ourselves, we say, yeah, because it's just there. And it's when it's no longer there that we begin to yearn for it and long for it. Could this be one of the reasons God has allowed all of this to happen? I truly believe that that is one of his purposes. Indeed, that is what happened to the people when they were taken into exile, because there they were, 70 years, they longed and longed and longed for their church. And now, so do you know what they did in exile? I think this is so interesting. Because they they didn't have a temple, their temple had been destroyed. They didn't have a place to worship. They began to gather in their homes. Does that sound familiar? Isn't that what we're doing today? As you're listening to this, aren't we gathering together in your home? Much the same as the God's children did during their Babylonian exile. You know what they called this? Those gatherings, those church home gatherings, they called them synagogues. That was the beginning of synagogues. They, they, the, it arose and was invented, actually, during the Babylonian exile. Now, we all know that synagogues continue today, but that's where it began. And we're doing the same thing, doing synagogue here. So let me go back to my notes. I've gone through quite a bit of it. So here it was. They were in exile, in exile for 70 years. Now, aren't you grateful that right now ours has only been seven months and we hope it won't be many more than that? But it was foretold that it would be 70 years, and the exile indeed did come to an end when Babylon, which again was part of King Nebuchadnezzar and then other kings, including King Darius, and then a Persian emperor known as Cyrus the Great, and you can read all about him. Cyrus the Great, he expanded his Persian empire, and he overtook King Nebuchadnezzar. He overtook he enveloped this Babylonian empire as part of the Persian empire. So now he's the new king. He's the new one that's over God's children. They're still in Babylonia, but they have a whole new leader known as Cyrus the Great. Cyrus was a pagan king. History tells us that. And God said 150 years before, that he was going to be sending somebody known as Cyrus. Wow, I love this. I love the fact that it's recorded. And these prophecies happened so far ahead. And here we see them in detail. In Isaiah 24, 28, God said this. He said, quote, Cyrus. Yes, this is the very same Cyrus. Cyrus. Cyrus, remember, he's a pagan king. God said, Cyrus, he is my shepherd. What? That's what it says. He is my shepherd. He will accomplish all that I please. And this Cyrus, he will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt. And of the temple, let its foundations be laid. 700 B.C., this was foretold. This was written, what I just read to you, 150 years prior to Cyrus's ascension to greatness, and it was fulfilled as we saw, as we have just read. And we remember that this is another pagan authority, Cyrus the Great, and God uses him to show his power, to show his great. Again, we see that God's glory is revealed through exile. And this time he uses Cyrus to do it. Wow. So God's church, God's church, his precious, beloved church, he allowed it to be raised He allowed it to be raided. He allowed the temple treasure to be taken because 
Hear me, hear me, hear me. Because he planned for it to be rebuilt. He planned that it would be restored. God never allows anything negative to happen to his church, but that he also knows that he has a positive plan to rebuild and restore. That's a promise. That's a spiritual principle written throughout Scripture. Throughout Scripture. So indeed, it says, listen to this, in Ezra 1, verse 1. In the first year, so this was written many, many, many years, about 150 plus years after the Isaiah that I just read about Cyrus will be my my shepherd and will restore and rebuild the temple. Remember that? 150 years later, in Ezra 1, 1, this is written. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, In order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah and Isaiah, the Lord moved in the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia. And he moved in his heart to make this proclamation throughout the realm and even put it in writing. And and we read this, uh, there's reference to this writing later. But this is what King Cyrus, king of Persia, says. Verse 2, the Lord, this is Cyrus's writing, the Lord, this is a pagan king writing this, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem and Judah. Imagine. Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem and Judah and build the temple of the Lord. God, God is moved in this pagan king's heart and said, let the people go. Let them go. Let them, those who want to return. This is that remnant I talked about. Let them go. And may their God be with them, it says. And in any locality where survivors may now be living, in other words, their neighbors, those people, their neighbors, are to provide these people who want to return. They're supposed to provide the remnant Silver and gold, goods and livestock, free will offerings for the God of Jerusalem. Imagine, imagine, this pagan king says, he puts out a proclamation and he says, okay, all of you people out there, I want you to give, to give, 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 give generously to these people, this remnant, so they can take it back with them to Jerusalem so that they will have the funds they need to rebuild Wow, God is a mighty, mighty God. And this is his church, remember, his church. And if that wasn't generous enough, verse 7 says this, Moreover, King Cyrus brought out the articles belonging to the temple of the Lord. He brought out that treasure. Cyrus brought out that treasure. It belonged to the temple of God and gave it to them to bring back and replace. Wow. God always retains a remnant, a group of people who are willing to go and rebuild when exile comes to an end. God always provides everything you need for restoration Restoration. What are the odds that a pagan king would return $50 billion worth of treasure? What are the odds? But when the odds are against us, remember, God is for us. God is for us. Next week, next week we will continue this story, but I, want to, I don't want to leave too soon. There's one principle out of here I want to make sure that you take away from today's message. Be encouraged when it comes to our church. Be encouraged. Do you think that God does not care for us as much as he did his temple? Of course he cares for us. He has said, Hope Center of Christ is the apple of my eye. And when we first started eight years, over eight years ago now, Morris Cirillo, my beloved friend Morris Cirillo, my beloved brother in Christ who went home to be with the Lord, Morris gave us a gift, a gift. And that gift has been used as capital improvements for this church in the last 
eight years. <laughs> it's really been interesting to see because that balance, the amount of money that he gave, even though we have used it, we've used it for this, we've used it for that, we've used it for this, we've used it for that, however it's been needed, that balance has re remained the same. It's always stayed. And that's a, that's a pr spiritual principle called, I call, the spiritual pl principle of replenishment. Replenishment. When you give to God's church, God replenishes, not just to the church, but to the person who, to whom, who gave it. And that's found in another quick little story in scripture, one of my favorites, the widow of Zarephath. Now that's a mouthful, the widow of Zarephath. But when the prophet Elijah, in the time of famine, was needing food and water, he encountered this widow collecting sticks. And Elijah went to her and he said, woman, Will you give me some bread to eat and some water to drink? <laughs> this widow said to him, Sir, I cannot. My son and I, we have just enough, a handful of flour, a tiny bit of oil, just enough to make a little bit for us to eat as our last supper, as our final meal. The sticks I'm gathering are to bake this last loaf, and we will eat it, and then we will die of starvation. This is all we have left in this time of famine. And Elijah looked at her and he said, well, if you give me some of that bread that you make, God will replenish. He will replenish the flour. He will replenish the oil. And it will suffice to carry you through the rest of the famine. If you were a widow and you had a son, <laughs> Would you have the faith, the faith of the widow of Zarephath? Because that is what she did. She took her last, her last little bit of life for her and her son, and she gave it to Elijah. She gave it to God, and God replenished, and God replenished, and God replenished, and God replenished. And, God replenished. and that's what he's done with more Cyrillus gift for us. He has replenished and replenished and replenished. I want to tell you one other very encouraging thing. God also moved in the heart of a widow shortly, about a few months before this virus hit. And she gave significant gifts to this church. And I didn't even realize that she had given it. And one day we were do at a board meeting, we were looking at our, our, our balance sheet, and I said, well, for the first time since Morris Rillo gave us that gift, we'd always had that same balance point. But for the first time, there was a significant jump, way more than usual. And I said, well, how come there's all this extra? And the person who helps us with our balance sheet said, we've been receiving an extra gift from a widow. And I said, wow. Did not know that the COVID was going to hit. And when COVID hit, we all know it, churches have had loss, and we have too. We continued to pay our mortgage for our beloved chapel so we wouldn't lose it. And God has blessed that. And yet we didn't have people coming and putting their offering, their tithes and offerings in the offering plate like they had been doing. There's been loss. Not much, but enough. Do you know that that amount of money that that widow gave has been sustaining us all this time? And our balance is still the exact amount of what Morris Sevilla gave us to begin with. God always retains a remnant. God always replenishes. God always restores. And believe me, when these doors open again, we will be able to rebuild.
because people, God is building within them a longing, a longing to come home to his church. So, last word. In the midst of exile, expect complete restoration for you too. Expect it. Also expect God to use times of exile to expand the church, which he's been doing. All these little synagogues have been popping up all over. People don't know them. They're not calling it that, but that's what he's been doing. He's expanding the church. Expect God during this time of exile to energize the church that people no longer take it for granted. Expect God to use this time of exile to embolden the church. To let people know, oh, we are not just at home here in this world. world. We're just passing through. We are the church of God preparing people for their final home, their home in heaven. So until we exit our exile, we will excel in our exile. And hopefully and prayerfully, I know that God will be glorified in the midst of our exile. So let us pray. Thank you, Lord. This is your church. Thank you, Lord. Scripture says we are your temple. We are the temple today that your Holy Spirit lives within us. And each of the children, your children, who are listening to me now, some of whom may be feeling fear, some of whom may be feeling a longing for home, some of whom have suffered loss as a result of being in this exile. Oh, encourage them now, Holy Spirit. Encourage them. Encourage them with a reassurance that this is a season. It will come to an end. This is a season It is not an extinction. And that you will carry them through. You will be glorified in their life and through their life. And that you will sustain. And not only that, you will replenish. You will replenish any losses, Lord. We ask that now. In Jesus' name, amen. Just stand up and raise your hands and sing this to the Lord that you're going to trust in God no matter what. Yes, Jesus.
And now, before I give you the benediction, I want to thank so many of you who have been giving so generously to this beloved church of ours. I want to thank you for all your gifts, your tithes and offerings. You've truly been widows of Zarephath giving when maybe you it was your last. I know that. But I thank you for it, and I thank you trusting and believing that God will replenish over and over, pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing. So I want to thank you. And now I want to give you the benediction. And now may God bless you and keep you. May God make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace that passes all understanding. May he give you faith, the faith of a widow of Zarephath, faith that's unshakable. May he give you hope that is unsinkable. And may he give you love that is unquenchable. God loves you, and I do too.